If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FP&A Today. Today, we're going to talk about how to improve your Excel skills. Joining me here in a few minutes, they were on the other uh, broadcast and they've had to switch over, will be uh, Celia Alves, Mark Proctor, and George Mount. All right, great. We have George here. And I'm going to throw George one question while we're waiting for the other guests to, to get on. I appreciate your help here, George. Sure. So maybe we'll start while we're waiting. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? And when did you first realize that Excel could be a difference maker for you in your daily work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Paul, for putting this together. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing the testament of technology, uh, its powers, and also it's the double-sided uh, <laughs> sword of, of, of its nature. But uh, for me, Excel started back when I was a new financial analyst, like a lot of you, uh, started in that role. And... Did not have the preparation to to succeed in that coming from more of a liberal arts kind of background. Um, I just remember, I think there was one particular task where my manager uh, shaded different rows with a different color and wanted me to be able to sort by color. So I actually went through and manually sorted that whole worksheet by color. It took me like a couple of hours. I didn't know that you could sort by color in Excel, right? And there's just co like constant little things like that, that I was just spending hours and hours and getting nowhere and making mistakes and giving the wrong numbers to people. And I was just not really fulfilling my primary role, which was to make life easier for the people who I work with, right? And uh, that really got me thinking about the power of Excel and from there, just the power of right automation and data analytics in general. So really all started out with just that primary motivation to give people what they need in a timely and, and accurate manner. And I think that Excel is so powerful on that front. So it's really cool to see so many people, including our two fellow MVPs here, uh, <laughs> tuned in around the campfire uh, talking about this stuff today. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mark and Celia, for being able to join us again. As I told everybody else, I'm not sure what happened, but when I tried to log in, it told me the broadcast had ended and it won't let you re-log into a LinkedIn live broadcast. So we had to... Uh, just go live on LinkedIn. So thank you for getting back here with us. And looks like we got most of our audience, or at least quite a few people back in. So George did a little bit of an introduction there about himself. We'll go to Mark next. Mark, can you maybe give us a little bit of your background? And then when did you first realize that Excel could be a difference maker in your daily work? Uh, so my background is I'm a, uh, I'm a qualified accountant. I qualified back in the early 2000s. And to be honest, I, um, in the in most of the 2000s, I thought uh, I was pretty awesome as it, at Excel because I knew VLOOKUP. So therefore, I was I was golden, right? I, I knew VLOOKUP, therefore I didn't need anything else. Uh, it wasn't until I started a new role in 2015 uh, where I'd already um, planned a, a vacation uh, before I started this role, and it turned out that I needed to save a day and a half on our five-day reporting cycle, uh, which was going to be a bit of a struggle. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to give macros a go. Uh, and within five hours, uh, I wrote a macro that saved me at that day and a half. And it then that then that was then used in that business every month. So that five hours has probably saved a thousand hours worth of effort. So that was like the real first uh, taste of what could actually be achieved. I then went into a, um, it's called a global reporting analysis role uh, for finance, which is a fancy term for FP&A. Uh, and through that, we had our month end packs and everything else. And we had month ends that we'd work till um, 11 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, just trying to get everything done. Um, and it was, uh, and it was a pain. And then through that, I was like, we've got to 
we've got to find a better way. And eventually it was like bit by bit, we chipped away at it, um, created tools, and then we could automate everything from all the way from here's our input, click refresh, goes through it, creates, updates your Excel documents. Uh, it then goes through, creates PDFs, it creates emails, it sends them out. You know, you can do all of that from inside Excel. Uh, so it's not just a tool for calculation, but actually your complete end-to-end -end, uh, can handle it. So that's kind of my background. And for the last uh, eight years since I started that previous role, that's what that's what I've been doing, trying to, trying to save uh, as much time as I possibly can to spend more time doing something else more enjoyable. Thank you, Mark. And Celia, will you want to give us a little bit about your background and kind of when you first realized that Excel could be a difference maker in your daily work? Oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, my case is a little bit different because I, the work that I was doing did not require much of Excel. I almost accidentally got acquainted with Excel in um, around 1994, my first year as a high school teacher. I went to a teacher's, my first teacher's conference, and I happened to choose one of the workshops to participate in. It was about Excel, maybe two or three hours workshop, I can't remember. So I was born and raised, I was raised in Portugal and I uh, studied mathematics. That's my background, academic background. I got a licenciate degree and a master's both in education and mathematics. And I started a teacher's uh, teaching career. Um, I uh, taught mathematics um, up to grade, uh, grade 12, um, 7 to 12 in, in for about 19 years. And uh, so I got acquainted with Excel my first year as a teacher. I figured it all out. <laughs> I thought, okay, this is, uh, this is Excel. <laughs> I understand the formulas. I understand that I can make a chart, a uh, couple of things. And I used what I learned that day during years and years. And I felt like the queen of Excel when I would enter those teachers' meetings with all my uh, students' uh, marks and averages and charts representing them, nice uh, spreadsheets printed on paper because we were not carrying uh, laptops at that time to our meetings. And that's what I was doing with Excel. And then uh, 2000, 2013, I moved to Canada with my husband and kids. And um, in 2015, I decided to try freelancing on um, online. And I decided that I was very good at Excel. And my first gig, I got acquainted with VLOOKUP. <laughs> so I beat you, Mark. I was able to work for 20 years without even knowing, using Excel without even knowing about VLOOKUP. And then I discovered that I, the, the task I was given, I thought I could give, do it with VLOOKUP, like Mark, he, he thought VLOOKUP solves everything. Uh, not in that case. So I started with VBA. I discovered forums in Excel, about Excel in online, YouTube videos, and that's when my journey started. Um, and later I got hired by a company to help them with their Excel uh, systems that were already in place to improve them. And I learned a lot from there. So that's when my journey about learning um, how to automate tasks in Excel started, those two uh, events there. Th thank you for sharing that, Celia. Uh, next question I'm gonna throw over to you, to you, George. So you started your career in finance, if I remember right, and you've commented previously that you know when you worked in finance, you were disappointed with technology within finance. Can you talk a little bit about that? What was it that you were disappointed? Where do you think finance was falling short? Yeah, it's kind of wild. So I started in finance maybe 10 years ago. And at that time, all this about like data science and machine learning data analytics, it wasn't really a thing quite yet, right? To the common everyday office worker, they hadn't really heard those terms before. Um, so it was finance had such an opportunity that they just kind of let go in a lot of ways, particularly uh, just having that mindset of if something can be automated, then maybe we should think about it. You know, not everything should be automated, but there are a lot of things that should be um, thinking about really looking at data as an asset that, that can be used and reused and, and uh, 
you know, given life uh, to, to help uh, guide the business. And I just didn't really see that mentality um, in, in the departments that, that I was in. I mean, to be fair, I think, especially back then, a lot of organizations, a lot of departments weren't really thinking like that. But, uh, you know, that really got me into uh, data analytics more so than finance, just because I found it a place to uh, really dig into the te technical aspect, you know, learn more about uh, programming, learn more about statistics, and uh, make a bigger impact in the organization. So it's kind of cool to see finally now finance is starting to see what it can do uh, in this arena. Uh, it took it a few years, but uh, you know I think that having the finance background personally has been helpful, right, for me uh, because we do have a lot of people, especially in the Excel world. There's a pretty strong overlap between right finance and Excel. Um, so we're still pretty well poised or finances. Uh, to, to make a big impact when it comes to to data analytics and, and automation. I agree. I think I, one of my favorite stories I remember early in my career, I took a VBA course and it was taught, it was when I was working at American Express. And the guy who was teaching it shared the story when he started his career, the guy still had, you know, a 10 key on his computer and next to his computer. And the guy entered all these numbers in the Excel spreadsheet. And then he added them up all on his 10 key and wrote the number down at the bottom. And the new guy said to him, I'm pretty sure you can use this something. I'm pretty sure we'll add it together. He's like, I don't know about that, but this is how we do it. And sometimes I feel like that's what we do, you know, with Excel or finances. We just stick with the way we know. And it's often, you know, time consuming and very inefficient. And so one of the things I've seen with Microsoft, and I think many people have seen this is over the last decade, Microsoft has made massive updates to Excel. We've seen Power Query, Dynamic Arrays, Lambda. Power Pivot, Let, and more. But it feels like despite all these improvements, many people are either not using them or not even aware they exist. Mark, any thoughts why that is? There's a there's a phenomenon that I think exists in uh, workplaces uh, where um, everything returns back to the lowest common skill set. So what happens is that somebody starts a new job, and let's say they are they're all up to date with everything that Microsoft are doing. They're fantastic at Power Query and everything else. They'll implement whatever solutions they'll come along. This is the way we should do it. They'll improve things. Eventually, they'll get bored, or maybe they get promoted out of that role. They go somewhere else, uh, and then from there, what happens is that uh, they then leave that job. Someone else comes in who has less knowledge or less experience. They don't understand it, and therefore they start to change things back to how it was, which means that things always end up reverting back to that lowest common skill set that people have. Uh, and so really it's about a training piece. It's about making sure that people have consistent training to stay up to date. The problem is that also within workplaces, people say, people have an issue, an Excel issue, so they ask their colleagues, how do I do this? And their colleague only knows one way to do it, and that's the old way. So those ways tend to get replicated over and over again. And with Microsoft, even though they create these new tools, they like, here's, here's a tool, go and use it. It takes a long time for that impact to really, um, to really happen. And we see that with Power Query. I mean, it's been around for over a decade now, or about a decade, and yet it's, it's now starting to pick up more and more pace. Um, so it's a... It needs that adoption and knowledge before people even uh, accept it. And I think it is a case of why when something works, would you try and look for a different solution? It's only once you've really got a problem that you then look for something else. So I th unfortunately, I think it's inherent in how businesses operate, how people operate, that it, it just doesn't get adopted as quickly as it should. Yeah, no, I agree. And I like the point uh, AJ said, I put it here on the screen. The issue is tribal knowledge and living in silos, right? Ple yep. As you said, people know how to do what they know. Making a change means taking a risk. Sometimes things can go sideways. So I definitely think there's some truth to that. I think a lot of things you said as well. Celia, what's your thoughts on that? Why do you think the adoption takes as long as it does? Yeah, I agree on uh, with Mark, and I, I made, it made me uh, recall a situation where I was trying to implement something in an organization with a con with a client, and they say, "Oh, people are not uh, Excel savvy. We need to make it simple." So there's always this pushing back, trying to make things easy because otherwise they will get problems, right? That they, something will stop in the middle of the process. So they they tend to, like Mark said, lower things down, and then. Um, 
I also think there's a lot of uh, lack of inquisitive, curio uh, inquisitive um, uh, mindset, uh, curiosity. I, I mean, I just told you my story. I, I went off to use Excel the way I learned it that day uh, for 20 years without questioning, does it, can it do something else? Is there something else? Uh, I, I didn't, didn't even bother to uh, explore all the buttons that were in the ribbon that I was not using. I was just using what I knew the best I could. And of course, we are always busy. So we just want to, well, I'll leave it to the next time. And then the next time never comes. Um, I also think that Microsoft does not do a great effort on um, marketing uh, the product. Uh, so they do put things outside, uh, MVPs like us, they, we do our best to, uh, tell the world about the new features available. But if you are not already aware that there is something out there that maybe you can hear from this person or that person that you follow online, you will never get to know about it. So it's a kind of a vicious cycle there. I, I agree. And I think I know you guys do a great job of socializing new things, the MVPs. And we see LinkedIn, I think, has helped a lot for people that get on LinkedIn. They can see all the different things from Excel and people announce the new Excel things. But Microsoft itself hasn't done a great job announcing it. I mean, I remember the first time I heard about Power Query and Power Pivot. I briefly heard about it, saw something, I don't know, it was 2015, 16, but I had no idea what they were. I didn't even you know touch Power Query till. 2017 when I was trying to figure out a project and all of a sudden I'm like, oh wait, this has been here for a couple of years? Like, how did I miss this? And it then became something that I used all the time. And so let's jump into Power Query because I think, you know, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest opportunities for finance and fp &A professionals to automate, streamline work. I see George nodding his head there in agreement. So that's good. So, you know, studies have shown fp &A professionals spend up to half their day wrangling data. And if that's one of you out there, just comment saying yes, or how many hours, I think we talked about how many hours you spend in Excel. So, you know, what are some of the things, I know Power Query is one, but Celia, what are things you'd recommend people learn if they really want to get, you know, better at dealing with data, whether that be pulling files together, you know, kind of that transformation, extracting data, what's your recommendation for them? The first thing, even before starting dealing with Power, learning Power Query, I think is understanding the difference between the two layouts, the layout to store your data and the layout to represent your data. Finance people and other professionals, but in this case, we are talking uh, mostly for financial people, tend to want to see timelines with the months and the years along the columns. And that's not the way you should store your data. But what happens is that a lot of times people tend to uh, input the information the way they want to see it at the end. So, for example, they are recording expenses and they go, oh, I have January, February, March. I have three expenses in March. So they go to the cell for March in that category of expense and they put in a formula equal 20 plus 100 plus 200. And then it's a nightmare having to scroll back and forth to find the correct cell and to, to put in the information. That's not the way people should do it. People need to make their minds to prepare their minds to work with the tabular layout. Tab tables, rows and columns is the way to store your data. So you need, if you have three expenses for March, you need to have uh, March 1, this amount, March 10, this amount, March 15, this amount, and then you use other tools to aggregate that information, to summarize it and represent it the way you want. Then you can use pivot tables. Then you can use Power Query to modify the layout and give you the give it the final layout that you want. Uh, so that's my first uh, advice: is start with start by understanding why you need to learn and use tables in Excel, and then go to pivot tables and uh, uh, Power Query. Thank, thank you so much, Shelley. I love that you brought up tabular data and tables. Learning how to set your data up properly is critical for pivot tables, for Power Query, for Power Pivot. When I teach my courses, I often say, if you want to unlock modern Excel, you need to understand first how to structure your data in a tabular okay. format. 
Because if you don't learn that, you're missing out. The habit we often do is we want to summarize it. We want to put it in the format we want to see it. But what we want is we want it in kind of almost like a database format where each record is its own row so that we can summarize it, so we can work on it and transform it. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. Data Rails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Data Rails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up-to-date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. You know, anyone who uh, follows me knows I'm a huge fan of Power Query. And so, George, we'll ask you first, and then we'll go to Mark. Can you just give a summary maybe of what Power Query is? A little bit of what the tool does and why people need to learn it. Yeah, I, I can definitely do that. And before I even start with that, with this topic of the primacy of having your data in a machine readable format, uh, I know the AI is all the rage right now. And I have a little demo I'm working on that I've showed in a couple of workshops already that even with the analyze data feature in Excel that lets you query your data using natural language and brings these machine learning insights into your data, that doesn't even work if your data is not in a proper tabular format. So that skill is not gonna go away just with AI and everything mm -hmm. happening. Um, you need to have your data in a proper machine readable format. So that really is, before we talk about any of this, so important. Um, as far as Power Query goes, it really is the, uh, repeatable data cleaning uh, tool inside of Excel. So if we think about this ETL process that some of you may have heard of, it's a lot fancier sounding than it really is, right? You extract your data, and I think we've all done this, right? Think of all the places, and if you want to leave in the comments, places where you get your data from, whether it's a data warehouse, maybe you're going to Salesforce, maybe it's just a series of CSV files, or maybe you have a whole folder of a bunch of CSV files. Um, Wherever that data is coming from, you can bring it in via Power Query and then do all those things that we all know and love week after week, right? If you think about all of the filtering and the right sorting and maybe you need to merge some tables together or whatever those kind of manual tedious tasks that you do. And sometimes you get in trouble because you don't remember, you, maybe you forget a step one week and then the whole thing breaks or maybe somebody's out of town and you can't talk to them about what they did. Uh, Power Query is going to lose a lot of those frictions for you because everything's going to be auditable. You can literally see step by step what's happening, right? Like I sorted my data here. I renamed the column here. So there's not going to be any more gotcha surprises about what happened. Um, and then from there, you can load your data into a variety of formats, including if, if any of you all are using uh, Power Pivot or, or the data model, you may have heard of that, uh, uh, to build a little bit more robust of a reporting structure in Excel. Um, the really good news with that, I mean, if that doesn't sound cool enough, this is all very applicable to Power BI as well. So if that's on your learning roadmap as well, you really get like a two for one deal here if you're going to learn Power Query, because a lot of this stuff is is equally applicable. Um, it's, it's really the same engine that's being used there in Power BI. So I'm sure everybody has their own way of uh, explaining Power Query, but for new people, I just like to use that kind of ETL structure. It's been around for a while. I think everybody knows the pain of that manual weekly report. And when they hear, oh my God, I can just build a, a, a menu that people click and it runs week after week, um, I think that that's a pretty good sell without even seeing how easy the product is to use. Thanks, George. So Mark, uh, what would you add about kind of Power Query and using it? So I would, say, I mean, I'd, I'd step back and let's step back a stage and go, right, what's the, 
What's the context in terms of FP&A? What's the blueprint that we're trying to follow in terms of all of our of our work? And ultimately, everything that happens in that in that finance realm in terms of reporting and analysis, there's a there's an underlying blueprint or method that we follow. So we start with our inputs, we then reshape our inputs into data. We take that data, we calculate on it, we take those calculations, we visualize them, we collect those visualizations together in some form of presentation, and then we distribute it. So everything we do falls into that pattern. And we might go from input up to a visualization stage. There might be a journal or an adjustment or something else. We might then push that back into that input phase and ultimately we go through this loop over and over again. So Power Query fits in that piece that goes from your inputs to then creating your data. So it's right at the start from taking your input and changing it into something useful. So if you want to automate anything or change anything, that the bit at the start is where is where that happens. The analogy that I often try and use is um, if you want to decorate your house, if you want to paint your the room in your house, um, if you've got an enormous hole in your wall, the first thing you shouldn't do is start painting. The first thing you need to do is to fix the holes, right? And then plaster it. And then once you've got this smooth surface surface, you can then start decorating. What often happens is that people take their data and their data is like that, that, that wall with an enormous hole in it. Uh, and then they take it and they start using formulas, which is like just going from a hole in a wall to painting. What they need to do is to get that smooth surface first. They need to get that data into an optimal layout so that the painting, which is the formulas, are then exceptionally easy. And that's the thing. If you set up your data correctly at the start, the formulas you need and the complexity of formulas you need suddenly reduces down to a, a much lower level. Actually, the Excel, if you use Power Query, the Excel skills you need later on are significantly lower than if you don't use Power Query. So you're doing yourself an enormous favor. And actually, you need less Excel skills later on because you've prepared everything in the right way. So, you know, that analogy of it's really just trying to get that smooth surface and everything in the right place before you even start decorating is the way I try and describe Power Query. And you know, the next the next week, the next month, when you start on your um, painting another room in Power Query, you click refresh and it automatically fills those holes and you're ready to start painting all over again. So that's how I would uh, describe Power Query in um, as that form of analogy. Thank you. I really appreciate that analogy you gave there. I had never heard it that way, but right. Filling the hole first, getting everything smooth before you paint and it makes it much easier, which is really true. If you clean up all your data, it's much easier to work with than you're trying to do it all with these complex formulas. You know, anyone who's ever written a long, you know, formula to try to clean up data, right? Mid, left, right, fine. You get a substitute, you get a big, huge, long formula where you're trying to do something that you know might be quite easy in Power Query, for example, learning it. So I could definitely relate to what you said there, Mark. And so I'm going to ask each of you here, you know, if someone's never heard of Power Query, where would you recommend they start kind of that learning journey? And George, we'll go ahead and start with you. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, I mean, obviously, going to one of the MVPs here is, is a good start. Um, I, I have a, a, a white paper on if you're an Excel user, your five things to know about Power Query. I'm sure I could distribute that in some way, maybe in the show notes for the podcast yeah, or something great. like that. Um, but yeah, think about, I mean, also to, to Mark's point, right? Think about where are those lumps in your wall right now, right? Like what are those steps that you maybe forget or that could cause your whole project to go crashing down when you try to update things? Um, I think having that kind of wish list, right? Because you do want to begin with the end in mind um, is important. And then from there, starting to see, you know, getting that that mental model behind what Power Query really is and where it fits in that workflow is pretty important. A lot of good resources for that in terms of the tactics. Um, I'll definitely throw my little white paper into the mix. And I know our fellow MVPs have other resources they've uh, liked to share as well. Uh, one thing that I want people to be aware of is Power Query lives inside Excel. And when you learn how to open the Power Query editor, it looks a little bit like the Excel grid, but it's not the same. Then there's a different mindset, a little bit, a little bit of mind shift that we need to do because in Excel, we can treat uh, our data cell by cell. 
we create a mm -hmm. formula that looks into that cell and does something to that cell to produce, a, 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 and maybe with other cells to produce the final result. In Power Query, the logic goes mostly in columns. So we, when we set an action to happen to something uh, in, to our data, most of the times we do it to happen to the entire column. So the reasoning is a little bit different. We also, uh, Power Query is a tool that allows you to import data from outside, from inside your Excel file or from outside. You can connect to other Excel files, you can connect to CSV files, you can connect to databases and say, give me the data, import the data, bring it here. But in the way, I want you to clean that for me. I want you to remove certain rows that I don't need, remove certain columns that I don't need, transform some certain columns because there's information in one uh, column only that needs to be split out by different columns. And all that happens in the way coming into the Excel file. And all that is automated like uh, George was explaining before and Mark. And the next time you just, uh, you, you, you prepare that automation once, next time you click refresh all or you click a button to refresh a query or a couple of queries and everything is repeated. So you only do that work most of the times once unless you need to make improvements to it. So what I mean with all this is that Power Query is easy to learn, but there's a couple of things to figure out. When you are importing the data from your source, you are doing all these transformations and sometimes people ask me, oh, but I don't want the, the, the rows to be removed from the data source. Yo, no, don't worry, because the data source is not touched. So that's the beauty of Power Query. It goes to the data source and transforms things in the way when they come to you, data is clean, but the data source was not touched. So all these different things uh, require a, li a little bit of mind shift from com when compared with what we are used to when working in Excel. And to save you time, I recommend that you find a course, uh, a structured course about Power Query. There's plenty of them out, out there. I have a course, Mark has a course. We have uh, great YouTube channels with a lot of free content there. I run an Excel meetup group, the Toronto uh, MS Excel Toronto meetup group that you can join for free. Every month we have uh, free sessions. Some of them are about Power Query. They're, the recordings are available for you people who are looking to learn, to sit in action, to have the materials, you can get those. So really start by practicing, understanding what it is, and save your, to save you time, I do recommend that you find an, a structured course because it will uh, allow you to connect the dots uh, faster and, and start making uh, good use of what you learn. Thank you, Celia. And I'm I'm a big believer in you know courses, books. There's a lot more than just reading people's blogs or watching YouTube videos. There's some value in the structure that you get from that. So I appreciate that, Celia. Mark, what would you recommend if someone wants to start today on learning Power Query? So Power Query is is easy until it isn't. Okay, when you first start, you're like, you're like, I can, I can get this data from here. I can do this. I can do that. I'm almost jealous of the people that can get their data from a structured database because you know what? You can pull that stuff in, and it's already in a pretty good format. The problem is that often we're connecting to Excel files. We have multiple header rows. We have a lot of transformation, a lot of cleaning. We have, you know, you get exports from accounting systems. Uh, columns might be in different places or with different names. So it's actually Initially, Power Query seems seems easy, and it and it is easy. But once you've got past the point of I can get stuff in, there are a lot of more complex transformations, and that's where if you just stick with with YouTube or blog posts, that's generally where most of them tend to finish. Um, you know, it's how do you how do you combine all the files in a in a folder? Celia's got on on her YouTube channel. She's got loads of stuff about dealing with tricky problems. I've got loads of stuff on my YouTube channel. I blog about dealing with tricky problems. George, you've got loads of stuff about dealing deal, deal with tricky problems. Yeah, he's not in. So he, he has as well. It's those tricky problems that that then frustrate people, right? Because they start learning Power Query, it's easy, and then suddenly they come across a format that, that it just doesn't work in that simple context. And that's where if you have a structured course, that actually you can then, it helps to join those dots. And it's not just about clicking a few buttons. Actually, you might have to go, uh, a bit deeper and actually change some of that M code. Nothing difficult, nothing 
hard, but you have to understand the basic concepts. And if you don't, you'll get to a point of Power Query where you'll get stuck and you go, oh, it doesn't work for me. And then you'll go back to the old methods and all your chance of automation will then uh, disappear completely. So I would say, yeah, you can start searching Google. You can search for blog posts and YouTube channels. There are, there's lots available, but books and courses are the only way that you'll ever draw all those bits together. As somebody who writes blog posts and puts things on YouTube, I know, you know, it's only ever a thousand words. It's only ever 10 minutes. I'm only ever trying to show you how one, th how to solve one problem. In a course, you get that context of, well, how do you solve multiple problems that all come along together at the same time? And how do they fit together in all those pieces of learning? So that's, I think, the best way to learn. Uh, and ultimately, on a course, you can learn something in seven hours, 10 hours, that on YouTube, you'll just be hunting for days, right? You'll just be watching YouTube video. No, that's not what I want. How about the next one? No, that's not what I want. So actually, it saves you a huge amount of time and it's much more efficient. So that's that's what I would suggest. Th thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. This next question is for George. You know, I know we talk quite a bit about Power Query. I know people, when they get into Power Query, Power Pivot, they often want to go beyond that. You know, they're like, okay, what else can I do? And you wrote a book about advancing into analytics and from going from Excel to R and Python. So if someone wants to go beyond Excel, what's the advice you would offer? I mean, obviously you're going to say buy your book, right? What's the advice you would offer people? They could, they could go to the website and read a trial though. So <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I guess. So the whole thing with Python, particularly, I get asked about it a lot, right? I wrote the book about it. Uh, if everything you're doing is working with Power Query and you're using the M language and everything is clicking in Excel, you don't see a need for it. That's cool. I'm in the US, it's a free country, you can do whatever. But if you find a reason that, you know, maybe something's work, not working well or you have that little itch, right? Your conscience is telling you there would be a better way to do this. Try it out, right? That's all I'm saying. Python is a great place to start. Um, you know, there are some ways to automate Python. Uh, I'm sorry, automate Excel with Python. Um, you know, if, obviously, if you're looking to get into uh, more advanced statistical analysis, machine learning and stuff like that, it's an option. You know, I can kind of hear the the crowd, the throngs of, well, why would I learn Python when there's Power Query? And it's an absolutely good question. But the, the the only thing I'll say to that is it's not in Excel right now, unfortunately. But if you go into Power BI, the Power Query editor in there has an option for inserting a Python script. So, you know, it's there for a reason. I think that the product folks at Microsoft probably know the product better than we do. So uh, that's all I'll say about the matter. And you can make your own choice because I think that trying to sell Python um, I don't know. People are going to either do it or don't. You can't sell to somebody who's not ready to be sold to. So uh, that goes for the book as well. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's an option. We'll leave it at that. All right. So we had a question here, and I'm going to throw this one to you, George. I'm going to put it up here. So someone asked, how can the automated Excel reports using Python? It looks like I use Query, but I only know the fundamentals of Python. So I think you talked a little bit about that. So where would you recommend they start if they're wanting to kind of bring a little bit more of Python into what they're doing. Yeah, so uh, I'm a big fan of books. That's my preferred way to, to learn. There's a great one by, I don't think I have it with me, uh, by Felix Zumstein called Python for Excel. It's another O'Reilly book. It'll look like this, but it's got a snake on it. It's not actually a Python, so people get confused about that. I know which uh, one you're talking about. I've seen yeah. that book, the snake yeah. on it. Um, it's, a, it's a really helpful one. There are a lot of possibilities. Um, you know, maybe there are things that, I mean, the nice thing with using Python is it's one language, right? So whether it's, you know, we talked about, Mark kind of talked about this whole workflow of you're bringing your data, you transform it, you're going to build your visualizations. Um, it does feel a little bit siloed at the moment in Excel, right? Because the way that you build your charts is different than the way that you build your formulas. It's different than the way you build your data model and everything's in a little different of a bucket. It's hard to integrate that sometimes. Python's really good. It's even called, you know, many developers call it that glue language, right? So whatever you're trying to do in that workflow, uh, Python's got the option uh, for that. So I definitely check out that book. Um, I would look at, uh, you know, maybe starting with one slice of that process because there are ways to, you know, maybe do one thing in Excel and another in Python. So, you know, take the, take the tricky parts of your process, see if you can automate it and, uh, it is going to take some time, right? So don't, I guess the other word of advice, if you're looking to Python, 
is like, don't uninstall Excel. That's not what anybody's saying. And you're not going to hear, obviously, <laughs> from MVPs that this whole like Python is better than Excel and you don't need to use Excel anymore. Um, that's don't don't listen to that either. So uh, yeah, don't listen to that. Also, you know, don't think that you have to learn Python, uh, right? Or that it doesn't have a use either. That it's superfluous. It's somewhere in the middle for everybody. There's like a spectrum. So you'll just find where you fall on that spectrum. Great point. I think that, you know, a good point is you find out where you fall and what you want to use it for and how much you want to dig into it. Cause you know, there's places it can help. There's places where Excel is very important. And I like how you point out, don't uninstall Excel because well, I'm learning Python now, so I don't need Excel. They can be used together. They can be complementary tools. Just like, you know, just because you've learned power query doesn't mean you have to forget how to use a lookup because you can do a join or forget. Yeah formulas you still you use it all in conjunction and then just a few people have pointed out here and i just want to mention a few of those as we've had a lot of resources mentioned in the comments so uh one person mentioned you know some great uh ken pulse matt ellington and miguel escobar have some great stuff on their skill skill wave website i'm also a big fan of ken pulse's book uh Mastering Your Data with M i think is what it is called now the version i have is still the original uh data monkey version but that's a great one. And there's a lot of others. I have a few books back on my shelf here around that. I know some other people mentioned uh, Leela Garani, Shandu is another one that was mentioned. So there's someone else said the Excel MVPs. You know, the three here are great ones to learn from. And I'd encourage you all to go to their website. You can see them mentioning, you know, their businesses here. But there's also many others because we all we all have different people that we gravitate toward for whatever reason. They may, you know, we feel comfortable with their learning and the way they teach. So there's plenty of resources out there. So we're going to do just a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up here. But what I want to ask is, so Excel is coming up on 40 years, right? We've all seen AI. I'm sure all of you have probably played pr played with chat GPT or BARD or seen, you know, generative AI and all these developments kind of transforming technology. You know, how do you think that will change Excel? And do you think there's any risk that Excel may go away one day. And we'll start with Mark. And I, by one day, I mean in the near future anytime. So the, the, answer, the answer to that short question is, I don't believe Excel will be going away anytime soon. Uh, the biggest thing with artificial intelligence AI is that if you mix artificial intelligence with actual intelligence, then that fantastically <laughs> augments our ability to do work and to be efficient. Unfortunately, if you combine artificial intelligence with actual ignorance, what you do is that you create this enormous snowball of a problem. And what, what, what I can see as a future is that people who have relied heavily on AI, they've created a solution, here we go, they've delivered it. Uh, their line manager next week then says, oh, can you update that to change this one bit? And at that point, they don't know how they really solved that first problem how they then change it and iterate over it, they're then relying on something that they didn't understand to start with. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the biggest issue with, in terms of AI. If you already understand the topic, have a base understanding of, of how things work, then AI can help you be more efficient. But if you don't really have that understanding, you need to use it more of a a learning tool. The problem is that it's a learning tool that openly says this may give you the wrong answers. So as a learning tool, it's there but has some, some limitations. I think in terms of Excel, it's all about augmenting our actual intelligence rather than us taking entirely from, arti from arti artificial intelligence because if we if we just rely on that, then we're in real trouble. I mean, even in even when you're building a data model, what what fields should be connected, what fields shouldn't be connected, all of those things are, if if they get it wrong, right, it causes a huge load of pain. And I don't think any business in their right mind would want to devolve all of that decision making to something that, that doesn't understand the context of what it's responding to and the consequences of that response. So. Excel isn't going away anytime soon, uh, but AI can definitely help us if we're applying actual intelligence. If we're applying actual ignorance, then um, we've only got ourselves to blame. Well said, Mark. I think uh, you summed it up very well there is combining human intelligence with artificial intelligence can make us more effective. But when you combine it with ignorance, you're just going to end up with problems. 
because you have to be able to validate that it's right. You have to know how to ask it the right questions. There's a level of knowledge you need to take advantage of it. And so I, I really like that answer. So the one question I want to ask, we'll start, we'll start this one with Celia. What is the one, one thing in Excel that you cannot live without? If you had to pick one, what would it be? Tables. Excel tables. <laughs> because I, I, I wanted to say Power Query. <laughs> but uh, with Power Query, I can do build tables. So maybe Power Query. It's so hard. I, I can't pick one. It's like to, asking me to choose one of my children. <laughs> I, I figured you might say that. I get it. So tables and Power Query. We'll go with those. We'll give you two. We'll go with those two. George, how about you? I had a very similar process. I think tables kind of are the, like Ohio is the heart of it all. Uh, tables <laughs> are the heart of it all at Excel. So uh, I think I'll go with that for now. All right, Mark. I'm just going to refer to my uh, to my learned, you know, MVP colleagues here. They, yep, yeah, I would agree with them 100%. Power Query and Tables, <laughs> master that, job's a good one. You know, I'd probably say the same myself, Tables and Power Query. So anyone else, feel free to jump in and mention what yours is. But just as a final kind of parting words, you know, if people want to get in contact with you, you know, anything you want to share with the audience, I know some of you had mentioned an some offers, you know, ways to, to get a hold of you. We'll give you each a chance to just go through and share that with the audience here. And we'll make sure we put anything you want in the show notes, George, your article. I know, Mark, you sent a special offer, as did you, Celia, on some of your courses. So those are out on my website. We'll also put those next week in the show notes. But maybe we'll start here on this one. We'll give George first opportunity. Any kind of final words or how can people reach you if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, not chat GPT because it'll tell you that, you know, I wrote a book on accounting in 1967 or something. So <laughs> AI, right? You got to have that such a kind of expertise. The best place is uh, either on LinkedIn, where we all are now. You can just click through. I've left a few comments. So go ahead, click through there. Uh, follow me, connect if you wish. Um, I also blog pretty regularly at stringfestanalytics.com. So it's just my business name without the space. Uh, if you go there, subscribe. I've got a pretty extensive uh, resource library with all sorts of uh, outlines, checklists, you know, anything that you could imagine for building your, your analytics arsenal in terms of what to learn, how to learn it, and so forth. Uh, so I think those are the, are the best sources uh, for, for me. All right. Thanks. Thank you, George. Mark? Yeah, in, in terms of me, so pretty much everything runs from excelofthegrid.com. Uh, so there's six years worth of um, blog post, seven years worth of blog post there now, uh, starting in the early days with VBA. And then since about the last six years, I've been heavily on Power Query and how we automate uh, our workflows. Uh, so there's also links there to my YouTube channel and you can find me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect there. If people want to contact me directly, there is a contact form on uh, excelofthegrid.com. In terms of a special offer, if people want uh, to find out more, uh, then if they go to excelofthegrid.com forward slash FPA, uh, there they can download. I've got two free of my uh, eBooks. You can download one on macros, one on dynamic arrays that people can have for free. And then there's a, a special offer for if people want to join my uh, training course, which is how we automate Excel from that first point of input going through those seven stages, including Power Query, all the way to how we distribute at the end. So that's uh, that's there if people want to take advantage of it, excelofthegrid.com forward slash FPA. Great. Right. Thanks, Mark. And Celia, we're going to go ahead and give you last word. Well, thank you. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I share my content, other people's content, news about Excel on LinkedIn. I have my newsletter that uh, those of you interested in knowing when Excel releases something new can subscribe and I also uh, tell about any Excel events that might be going on that people might be interested in participating in. So that's the newsletter. There's the MS Excel Toronto Meetup Group where you can learn uh, every month from a new uh, presenter about a different topic and you can have the recordings. On my website that is the display there under my name, solvingexcel.ca, you can connect with me there. I'm also on uh, Instagram if you like more the kind of a short tips I also publish uh, uh, those on Instagram. 
And there's a 20% off for my course about um, reporting, automation of reporting procedures in Excel that you can grab and take advantage of for a couple of days. I, I believe Paul has the link for that. If you cannot find information, feel free to connect on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll give you the, the information. Thank you, Celia. And I just want to give a special thanks first to our uh, guests here. Thank you, George, Celia, and Mark for joining me and to the audience. Thanks for uh, staying patient as I know we had a few technical issues and it took us a little while to get started here. But thank you everybody for joining today. And you know, please feel free to reach out to any of these with questions you have or myself. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody.